Hello and welcome to my basics presentation for Edexcel Combined Science Physics Paper 6. This is basic information only so it's not going to get you a grade 9 but it should be able to get you up to about a grade 6. It does not cover everything, be warned. Do not just listen to this presentation, make sure you're taking notes or making mind maps or drawing diagrams. Um, if you don't understand a bit, pause it, rewind, re-listen to bits and make sure you're practicing exam questions as well. We start off with topic 7 and 8, um, energy, forces and work, in which we look at work and power and vector diagrams. Now, stored energy, two particular types you need to know about. We've got gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Gravitational potential energy is objects uh, is energy stored in objects based on how high they are. And we don't calculate gravitational potential energy itself so much as changes in gravitational potential energy. So the change in gravitational potential energy is the mass times the gravitational field strength times the change in height. So we say delta GPE, that, that thing there, that triangle, is delta, um, which means change. Okay, So the change in GP equals the mass times the gravity times the change in height. Now remember, the gravitational field strength on Earth equals 10 newtons per kilogram. That is a fact that you must memorise. Um, and we need to just make sure that the mass is in kilograms and the height is in meters. The energy, the units of gravitational potential energy will be joules because it is a type of energy and all energy has units of joules. Kinetic energy is energy stored in moving objects. So we can think of it as movement energy. And the equation of this is kinetic energy in joules equals half times the mass in kilograms times the velocity squared. And that's important to make sure we get that squared in there. Okay, so Ke equals half times m times v squared. Now, you may need to rearrange this, and most of the rearrangements of this are okay, but the hard one is to rearrange it for v squared. So we uh, can rearrange that as followed. So if we want to calculate v, we're going to say v squared equals Ke divided by half times m. That's moving that term down there. But to find v itself, we need to square root that. So we can say v equals the square root of ke over half times m, like that. So don't forget that square rooting if you have one of these rearrangements to do in the exam. Work and power are two related concepts. Work is the amount of energy transferred by a force and power is how fast that happens. It is the rate of energy transfer. So when we talk about work, we're giving it units of joules because it's a type of energy. Um, and the equation for it is straightforward. It's work equals force times distance. You may need to convert that distance from something other than meters. Um, and that combines into the equation triangle here, where we have energy equals force times distance. Um, power, as I said, is the rate of energy transfer. And that word power, actually, when we say that someone is stronger than someone else, actually really we mean that they are more powerful. If you're stronger, it means your muscles can transfer more energy each second. So really, actually, you're, you're more powerful. The units for power are watts. So a watt is one joule per second. If your muscles had a power of 50 watts, it would, could mean they would transfer uh, 50 joules of energy each second. And uh, the equation for that is power equals work done divided by time. Again, make sure you get your units right. So you may need to convert your time from, say, minutes into seconds by multiplying by 60. And that combines into the equation triangle here, um, E at the top and P and T at the bottom. Um, note in both of these that the work done is represented by E standing for energy rather than W standing for work. Broadly speaking, we can think about forces as being one of two types, contact and non-contact. Now, a force is simply a push or a pull. So a contact force is a push or a pull when you need two things to be in direct contact for it to happen. And a non-contact force is when the force doesn't need direct contact in order to be exerted. So in terms of contact forces, some common ones are friction, created when two surfaces rub past each other. That's reduced by lubrication. 
then we have up thrust which is the force created by water pushing up when on an, on an object like a boat that is floating in it and then we have normal contact force and normal reaction force now these are the two forces created by newton's third law or de described in newton's third law um, normal contact force is the force created when you push on anything so in this case it's this the force created when the finger pushes on the wall um, but it could also be when your foot kicks a ball when your bottom is resting on the chair you're on right now or whatever it is okay and then normal reaction force is the newton's third law bit the equal but opposite force created by the object pushing back so in this case the normal contact force is the finger pushing on the wall the normal reaction force is the wall pushing back on the finger and then we have non-contact forces these are forces where you don't need direct contact for the force to be exerted um, so uh, magnetism for example you know two magnets can attract even though they're not touching to each other um, touching each other um, uh, two two norths will repel two south will repel but opposite poles will attract um, similar with electrostatic forces so you know um, that a plus and a minus charge will be attracted to each other like um, like the cation and anion in an ionic bond um, but two negative two positive charges will repel each other and also we know that gravity gravity acts at a distance you know if you jump off a wall or something you're still pulled downwards even though you're not actually touching the earth um, we often describe forces in diagrams like these these are called free body diagrams um, and they try to show all the forces acting on an object um, and from that you might need to con calculate something like the resultant force and things like that topic nine electricity this talks about circuits current voltage resistance and power now first of all the basics of an electric circuit an electric circuit we need to have a clear path traveling from negative all the way back round to the positive okay um, and that's for the electrons to flow around now current is the flow of charge around a circuit and we talk about it in two related ways current really is defined as the flow of positive charge and it flows from positive to negative in the direction uh, of this blue arrow there okay that's conventional charge uh, conventional current rather but actually really in practical terms current is the flow of electrons so i find it much better to think about it uh, as the movement of electrons from negative to positive and you can see that happening with those um little blue dots representing electrons just traveling back around the circuit like that so just be aware that conventional current flows in the opposite direction to electron uh, flow now with circuits we broadly speaking we talk about series circuits and parallel circuits okay uh, a series circuit is one where there is only one path for the electrons to flow so in this uh, example here uh, electrons leave the negative end of the battery flow through the switch through lamp c lamp b lamp a and back round the positive terminal of the battery in one continuous path there's nowhere else the electrons can go in a parallel circuit the electrons flow out of the negative uh, one and then go through the switch and they can go by lamp a or they could take a different path go by lamp b or they take a different path again and go by lamp c so a parallel circuit is one with multiple paths um, and that will be important when we talk about ideas of voltage and uh, current and how they they change in different types of circuits now when we draw circuits you'll notice and we draw them in simplified form so um, first things first straight line and a ruler and a pencil uh, for drawing your wires then the different symbols um, we've got a switch um, a cell um, a cell is one of those little round things you put in your tv remote it becomes a battery when there's more than one um, we have a battery lamp is a circle with an x a meter for measuring current is a circle with an a a voltmeter for measuring voltage is a circle with a b a resistor is a clear uh, rectangle a variable resistor is a rectangle with a arrow at a slant in it a diode is a triangle with a line and a circle and then we've got an ldr which is a resistor in a circle with two arrows coming in towards it those arrows represent light now potential difference aka voltage uh, in exams you will normally be awarded credit for 
uh, using either of those words. I would tend to use voltage because I just find it a more useful word. So uh, the voltage is what pushes electrons around a circuit. So the voltage is really the beginnings of everything we do with electricity because with no voltage, no electricity can flow because there's nothing pushing the electrons around. Now, voltage also represents the energy carried by the current. And if we look at its units, the units are volts. Okay. And note here, one volt equals one joule per coulomb of charge. So coulomb is the amount of electricity that's flowed. And so the voltage of the current is directly related to the amount of energy carried by each coulomb of charge. So if the voltage was 20 volts, each coulomb of charge would carry, would transfer 20 joules of energy and so on. And you measure um, voltage with voltmeters and they are connected in parallel. So if you look at there and there and there and there okay you'll see that each of the voltmeters is connected to those bulbs in parallel so remember parallel is on a different branch so you can see that this voltmeter is connected on a different branch to the battery that it's trying to measure look at the way that voltage changes in a series circuit so if we look at this nine volts supplied by the battery it becomes three volts at each of the lamps so voltage gets shared out in a series circuit but on a parallel circuit it does not so if we look here first of all the total voltage is nine volts because we've got six and three because we've got two different batteries and then you can see that on this branch of the parallel circuit the voltage in that one bulb is nine volts and yet here the voltage in each one is four and a half. So we've got a couple of things happening. First of all, the total voltage on each branch is the same as it is at the batteries. Okay. Uh, and then on the branch here, the total is going to come to nine because it's being shared out among two different bulbs, 4.5 volts each. Now current. Current is the amount of charge that flows each second. Okay. And charge is the result a voltage so remember voltage is what pushes the electrons around the circuit so current is the result of the voltage now its units are amps and one amp is one coulomb per second so remember coulombs here is our unit for charge and so if the current was 20 amps it would be 20 coulombs of charge flowing each second and so on now in a series uh, circuit and um, the current stays the same the whole way around so if we look at this one we can see the current is staying the same at every ammeter. So we've got 0.8 amps, 0.8 amps, 0.8 amps, 0.8 amps, and so on. And I think that makes sense because there's nowhere else for the electrons to go. So every electron leaving the battery here must be going through every part of the circuit. So the, so the current is staying the same in every part of the circuit. Current, I should say, is measured by an ammeter. If we look at ammeters, they're connected in series. So you can see uh, how the ammeter here, for example, is connected in the same line as the battery it's measuring. Uh, in a parallel circuit, current splits up. So um, if you've got 0.8 amps leaving the battery here, when it gets to the junction, some of it will go this way and some of it will go this way. Okay, Which means that the current on the branches is less than the current at the battery. But notice the 0.2 amps and the 0.6 amps adds back up to the 0.8 amps you had at the battery. So you're not losing current, it's just being shared out uh, between two different branches. Sometimes shared equally, sometimes not. It kind of depends uh, exactly what components are on each branch. Okay, so charge is the amount of electricity that has flowed through a circuit in total. And um, so charge is calculated by multiplying the current times the time Again, as always with time, just watch your units. At one point in the exams, they will trip you up by giving you a time in minutes and you will have to convert it into seconds by multiplying by 60. So we can say charge equals current times time or Q equals I times T. The units of charge are written as capital C, which stands for coulombs. And current, we already know, is amps, which is the number of coulombs per second. Um, so we get the uh, equation triangle here. Uh, is Q at the top and then I times T at the bottom. The energy transfer by electrical charge um, is the charge in total 
times by the potential difference. So E equals Q times V. Um, and get this equation triangle here. The reason this works, if you remember, we said that um, potential difference is the number of joules per coulomb. Okay. So if we multiply potential difference by the number of coulombs, that will, by logic, give us the total amount of energy that's been transferred. Okay. Resistance is the sort of the final piece of our electricity puzzle. So resistance is the difficulty with which charge passes through a material. So it's a property of materials and different materials have different uh, levels of resistance. The units of resistance are ohms. Okay. And note the symbol, it's that upside down horseshoe looking thing. That is actually the Greek letter omega. Now, things that are electrical conductors that can carry electricity well have a low resistance, whereas things that are insulators that don't carry electricity very well uh, have high resistance. And we get this equation. It says potential difference in volts equals current in amps times resistance in ohms. V equals IR. That turns into this equation triangle, which is a really useful one to remember. But I don't actually think this equation itself is particularly helpful. I think it is better written out in this form here. This is just the rearranged version of the above equation. And it says current equals potential difference divided by resistance. The reason I think this is better is because current is the actual um, flow of electrons, flow of charge that results from two things. So it sort of gets to the heart of what's actually happening to produce the current. What this tells us is that current is higher if potential difference is higher and it's lower if resistance is higher. Because if potential difference is on the top of that equation, then the bigger the potential difference, you know, the bigger V here the bigger the current that results. But also, the bigger resistance, the smaller the current will be, because if you're dividing by a bigger number, you will get a smaller answer. So I think current equals a potential difference over resistance is a better way to remember that equation. Resistors are components of a circuit that control how much current flows to each part. And when we draw them, they look like this. So they're a, a, a rectangle with two lines sticking out. and we use them to make sure that each part of a circuit gets the right amount of current. So, for example, if you think about a TV, there are some parts of the TV that if they get too much current, they will blow. And equally, if they don't get enough current, they won't work. So resistors can be used to get the exact right amount of current to each part of the circuit. Now, if we think about a series circuit, the resistance of a series circuit is the sum of the individual resistors added up together. So if we look on this series circuit here, we've got these three different resistors, 15, 30 and 30 ohms and the total resistance is all of them added up together so it's just 15 plus 30 plus 30 makes 75 ohms now in a parallel circuit the resistance uh, on each branch is what's important so we don't add up all the resistors just the resistors on each branch okay so in this case if the current flows around this branch okay it only has the one resistor which has that 30 ohm rating. So the resistance of that branch is 30 ohms. And then the middle branch here, we've got these two resistors. So the resistance of that branch is 45 ohms. Okay. What we do not do, we don't add all three together to make 75 ohms because we have to think about each branch separately. Using what you know about circuits, you may need to solve problems with them where you have to find out, say, an unknown current, an unknown voltage, or an unknown resistance. Um, you will always be given all the information you need, but you may need to use equations like V equals IR or other basic rules you know about how circuits function in order to solve them. Um, so let's start with this one. So to find the current at X, um, we can use the V equals IR equation, but rearrange it to into the form I equals V over R. Now we just need to find a voltage and a resistance to put into it. Now, here we have a pair of voltage and resistance. So we're going to use 8 volts and 20 ohms. Uh, and if we do 8 volts divided by 20 ohms, we end up with a current of 0 0.4 amps. Now, really helpfully, that current will be the same all the way around the circuit because this is a series circuit. Now, the next one to find is Y. Now, V equals IR is not going to help us find Y because we don't have the right pair 
of uh, current and resistance that we can use for it. So what we'll do instead is we'll note that the voltage at the battery is 24 volts, but and at the first resistor it is 8 volts. So y must be whatever you need to add on to 8 to make 24. So um, y is just going to be equal to 24 volts at the battery minus the 8 volts at the other resistor and that leaves you with 16 volts and finally we're going to have z here z is a resistor so we're finding the resistance and now again because we've got our 0.4 amps as our current and we've got 16 volts as our voltage we can just use the v equals ir equation but this time we're going to rearrange it so we're going to say resistance equals voltage over current if you're not sure why check out the triangle here resistance equals cross through that because we're saying resistance equals and we're left with voltage divided by current so v over i our voltage was 16 we just found that out and our current was 0.4 we found that out earlier and if we do that that is going to come to uh, 40 ohms so if you get a problem like this the main thing is just to uh, keep a cool head and to look at what you can calculate using the equations that you know and everything should slot into place if you just work one step at a time as we've just seen resistors are used to vary the resistance of different parts of a circuit but there are a range of different resistors that we need to be aware of so um, if we just start with a standard resistor first of all with the oblong uh, symbol they have a fixed amount of resistance and if we were to draw a graph showing the voltage on the x-axis and the current produced on the y-axis that graph is direct proportional so remember direct proportion means a straight line that passes through the origin zero zero a second type of resistor is an LDR which is a light dependent resistor and it's got a symbol like this um, these arrows coming in are supposed to represent light going into that resistor now these are resistors that change their resistance dependent on the amount of light so when it is dark they have high resistance and when it is low so when it is light they have low resistance thermistors do a similar thing but they change based on the temperature so if we look at the symbol here um, it's like a resistor symbol but with a, um, a sort of a slightly uh, bent line going through it um, but they have high resistance when it's cold and low resistance when it's hot um, and so both LDRs and thermistors are used to vary the resistance based on the condition so for example an LDR you might be able to use it to switch on a fan or something uh, when it gets lighter during the day with a thermistor you might use it to um, switch on the air conditioning um, when it gets hotter something like that next we have a diode now here is the symbol for a diode if you look at the diode it's got this triangle with a line that's supposed to represent the idea that current can go forwards through the diode but it can't go backwards so these things have very high resistance when current flows one way and very low resistance when current flows the other way and if we draw a graph of the voltage and the current again it looks something like this so we have this section here this shows the idea that when there is a positive voltage current flows because resistance is low but this flat section shows that with a negative voltage no current flows that's why the graph stays flat um, and that's because the voltage is going the other way and it has very high resistance in the other direction and lastly we've got a filament lamp these don't really control resist resistance but they do depend on resistance to work so the, we've got the symbol here and the idea is that they've got this very thin wire in them and as the current flows through them um, the, res uh, you know, the resistance that heats up the wire and as the wire gets hotter the resistance increases so it heats up the wire more and the resistance increases even more and so on and so on and so on and you get this runaway effect which leads to leads the wire to glow bright white so they have high resistance when they're very hot and low resistance when they're cooler and if you draw a graph you get this pattern like this where you have increasing the voltage increases the uh, current but then it levels off that level leveling off section over here and the leveling off section down here are both where the resistance is increasing when it gets to a very high temperature now we did a core practical on this stuff to do with uh, voltage current and resistance and the aim of it was to investigate how changing the voltage and the resistance of a circuit 
affects the current produced. So we set up each one of these circuits, one, two, three, there. Um, and for each one, we set up the circuit. Um, we put the, set the power pack to one volt, but we didn't use that voltage. We actually measured the voltage of the power pack. So we joined a little voltmeter in parallel across the power pack. Um, and then we recorded the readings on each of the ammeters and the voltmeter. Um, and we repeated that with each voltage from one volt up to six volts. And we repeat it with each circuit. Um, and we also use those readings to calculate the resistance of the circuit too. So in circuit number one, we just simply had a resistor and we are seeing how the current through that varied as you increased the uh, voltage. Circuit number two, we had a series circuit with two bulbs. And again, we measure the voltage across each one and we had an ammeter for the current and we measured how each one changed as you increase the voltage at the power supply. Circuit number three was a parallel circuit. So this time we had two bulbs again, but on separate branches like this. And again, we're measuring the uh, voltage at each one um, as we increase the voltage at the battery. But also the important thing is that as well as having the ammeter on the main branch, we had an ammeter on each individual branch too, so we could look, explore the idea that um, the current was less on the branches than it was on the, uh, on, the on, on the main trunk, as it were. And what we found when we did this was that as the voltage increased, the current increased, um, and the resistance of the circuit stayed fairly fixed. Electrical power is the rate of energy transfer or use. Um, and we have this very simple equation that we've met before in a different context, which is power equals energy transfer divided by time. Power is in watts. Um, and if we look at here, we can see that a watt is one joule per second. So if you had a power of, say, 650 watts, that would mean that every second you transfer 650 joules of energy. Um, we have the energy transferred and then that is in joules and time should be in seconds. Now. That's our standard equation for calculating power in most different contexts. But if we're thinking just about electricity, there's, a, there's another way to calculate it, which actually works out to be the same thing. We'll see why in a second. So we have power equals current times potential difference. Power, again, is in watts because it's power. Current is in amps and potential difference is in volts. Now, this is actually the same as the first equation, and I'll try and show you why. It's a little bit obscure, so just bear with me. Now, we've got to think about the units here. So, potential difference is in volts. Now, if you remember what volts are, volts is the number of joules of energy per coulomb. So, we can write that as joules per coulomb, like that, okay? And we're multiplying it by current. Current is the number of uh, coulombs of charge per second, so it's coulombs divided by seconds. Now, if you look at the maths of this little sum here, the two coulombs, one on the top, one on the bottom, cancel each other out. And what we're left with is joules per second. So it is the same thing as this one. We're dividing energy by time. Energy by time. Okay. A second equation for calculating power is uh, power equals current squared times resistance. That's this one here. Okay. So power, again, is in watts. Current is in amps and resistance is in ohms. Okay. Now, again, this shouldn't be too much surprise because um, this is really just a rearranged version of this equation here. If you remember, okay, the equation V equals I R, okay, if we take this equation and instead of writing potential difference, we write current times resistance, we've already got current here, we end up with current times current times resistance, i.e. current squared times resistance. So these two equations, although they look very different, are actually very closely related. As always, if you're given things in different units, don't forget to translate them. Electricity is used so widely by us because we can very easily transfer the energy in electricity into other different forms. And we can calculate the energy transferred as the current in amps times by the potential difference in volts times by the time in seconds. Again, don't forget to translate. Um, you might be given kilovolts, you might be given minutes, you might be given, say, milliamps, and all of those need converting into the standard units before you use them. 
Now, one unhelpful or often unhelpful energy transfer involved in electricity is the transfer of electrical energy to heat. And this is normally caused by resistance. And it works something like this. If we look at this diagram here, each of these blue circles represents an atom in a metal wire. Okay. Now, as the electron moves through the uh, metal, it doesn't just move in a straight line, but it's continuously just bumping into all the atoms. You can see that happening here. Okay. Now, every time it bumps into an atom, it makes it start vibrating. Okay. So the more electrons bump into these atoms, the more they vibrate. Um, and the vibration of atoms is heat energy. So every time the electrons bump into atoms, it just makes them vibrate, which makes them heat up more. And also the more they're vibrating, the more easily they're hit by the electrons. And so we get this sort of slightly runaway effect. Now, every time the electron bumps into the atom and makes the atom heat up, the electron itself loses a bit of energy. So this idea explains how electrons lose energy as they travel through a wire by transferring it to heat energy as they collide with the atoms. Uh, that in turn means the amount of electricity decreases um, or the electrical energy decreases and um, this is uh, really what resistance is all about. It's about electrons colliding with atoms. Now, if we think about electrical energy transfers in kind of more detail, we normally want them, um, for example, with our light bulb that's turning electrical energy into light energy or our loudspeakers that turn electrical energy into sound energy. So we always, we always want the energy to be transferred, but there is an unfortunate thing because of what we saw on the previous slide about uh, the effect of resistance, always, whenever we produce the energy we want, which I'm just calling something here, so we get electrical energy becoming something, maybe light or sound or whatever, and thermal energy, so we're always going to get some wasted heat energy caused by that um, resistance effect we mentioned previously. This leads to what is called the dissipation of energy. Dissipation is the idea that the energy spreads out and becomes less useful. Um, linking it to other ideas in the in the physics syllabus that's why the efficiency of electrical gadgets is always below one because we always get some energy lost by dissipation okay now in terms of the electricity that is or the electrical current that is used in different circuits we can either have direct current or alternating current in direct current the electrons flow continuously in a single direction so um, direct current is abbreviated dc and you can see DC current here, if you look at these electrons, they are just moving continuously around in the same direction. Okay. The alternative is alternating current in which the electrons switch direction many times each second. Now we call that AC and you can see that on this diagram here, the electrons are going backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. So they keep switching directions. Now this is just a diagram. In reality, the alternating current that's in the um, in our uh, electrical supply to our houses and businesses is not switching time, switching direction once every few seconds, it's switching direction about 50 times a second. So we say it has a frequency of 50 hertz, which is what's down there. And our domestic electric supply, as well as being 50 hertz alternating current, also has a voltage of 230 volts. Just there. Electrical safety. Now, if a um, electrical appliance develops a fault, such as a loose wire or something like that, it can cause dangerously high currents to flow through the um, uh, appliance, which could mean um, something uh, as unpleasant as uh, dangerous electric shocks to the person using it, or it could potentially uh, lead to fire. So most electrical equipment is fitted with safety devices to prevent this happening. Now, the main type of safety device is called a fuse. Um, now fuses go in the plug uh, uh, for your electrical gadget and they look like this. Now the key part of the fuse is this thin metal wire that you can see running through there. Okay? Now the fuse is connected between the live pin and the brown live wire. And the idea is that if there's some kind of fault that causes too much current to flow through the uh, uh, fuse, then resistance will cause the fuse to heat up and it will melt like that okay and that breaks the circuit and stops more electricity flowing now this is a really good uh, really reliable really effective um, way to uh, sort of ensure a degree of safety but it does take a little while it's a fairly slow process and it's a real nuisance to replace them you know when a fuse is blown the only way to get the plug to work again is to unscrew it and to put a fresh fuse in now an alternative to this 
is circuit breakers. Now you will all have a circuit breaker board um, somewhere in your house or flat, which looks a little bit like that. And it's a series of switches designed, again, that if too much current flows through them, the switch trips and that switches off the circuit. And that would be, you know, like your downstairs lighting circuit or your upstairs lighting circuit or something like that. Now, really importantly with these, they are super, super quick. The circuit breaks in you know, sort of a 20th of a second or thereabouts. So it means that the dangerous currents flow for such a short time that it's very unlikely that serious damage will happen. And the other thing is they're super easy to reset. Rather than unscrewing anything, all you need to do is flip one of these switches from the down position back into the up position. Topics 10 to 11, uh, which are all about electromagnetism, in which we talk about magnetic fields, electromagnetism, the motor effect and transformers. Magnets and magnetic fields. So we all know what a magnet is, I think, but a magnetic field is the area of magnetic force around a magnet. So it's the, it's the area that is affected by the magnet's magnetism. Now, you are familiar with the idea that most magnets have a north pole and a south pole. And we find that the magnetic field, we can represent it as a series of magnetic field lines pointing from north to south. So if you have a look on these field lines, they've all got a little arrow going in the north to south direction. And for a bar magnet, they've got this sort of funny shape here where they sort of curve around and get increasingly curvier and curvier and so on. Now, the lines don't really exist, but what they do try and show uh, is areas of the same strength magnetic field. So if we pick this um, uh, magnetic field line here, everywhere on this line experiences the same strength of attraction to that magnet. Now, where the magnetic field is stronger, the magnetic field lines are closer together. So you can see the magnetic field is strongest at the poles and weakest away from the poles. Now, this is a bar magnetic field, but we can produce a uniform magnetic field by putting the two, two ends of two different magnets uh, next to each other. And what we get is something like this. So this is the north pole of one magnet and the south pole of another. And in between the two of them, we have these straight lines of magnetic field pointing again from north to south. Uh, and that's what we call a uniform magnetic field because everywhere in this area, the magnetic field is the exact same strength. We also have different types of magnet. We have the idea of permanent, temporary, and induced magnets. A permanent magnet is, is, is the normal magnet that you're used to, the kind of thing you might put in your fridge uh, or whatever. They're always magnetic and there's, you know, they more or less stay that way forever. Then we have temporary magnets. These are things like electromagnets that are magnetic when you run electricity through them, but they're not when you stop the current. And then finally, we have induced magnets. Now, this is the idea that if a piece of sort of iron or steel is in a magnetic field, it temporarily becomes a magnet itself. The permanent magnet induces uh, magnetism in the uh, in the in the paperclip or whatever it is you're talking about. Um, so you will have seen uh, if you pick up a, a paperclip with a with a magnet, you can then attach another paperclip to the first paperclip because it's become a temporary magnet itself. And that's what we call induced magnetism. Now, the Earth has its own magnetic uh, field, which is how compasses work, because a compass always points towards the North Pole. Now, we have to be clear on the difference between the geographic North and the magnetic North. The geographic North is actually the magnetic South of the Earth. And that's why um, that's why the North of a um, compass needle points towards the magnetic the um, geographic north because that's actually the magnetic south pole of the earth and you can see that here so that is our south pole and that is our north pole of the earth's magnet and finally in terms of how we trace a magnetic field we can do that using plotting compasses so the idea is we get a little plotting compass that's a tiny little compass like this and we note which way uh, it is pointing so we, we, we might put one here Note which way the arrow is pointing, draw a little dot, move the compass along one, note which way the arrow is pointing, draw a little dot, note where the, uh, move the uh, compass along, note where it's pointing, and draw a little dot. And if we do that, we can sort of systematically trace out the lines of equal magnetic field. 
electromagnetism describes the related phenomena that when electricity flows through a wire it creates a magnetic field and also when a magnetic field moves past a wire it can create an electric current okay now when a current flows through a wire and it makes this magnetic field we can call it an electromagnet so that is a magnet that is only magnetic when an electric current is flowing now to get the basics all we need is a straight wire with electric current running through it and if we if we look at this uh, diagram here if we take a wire okay and we pass it through uh, a say a, a flat piece of card and we sprinkle iron filings on it those iron filings arrange themselves in this circular pattern along the lines of the magnetic field around that wire okay and we describe that magnetic field as being made of concentric circles unlike a bar magnet which has a north and a south the magnetic field lines don't run from north to south because there is no north and south but they do still have a direction and we work out the direction using the right hand rule the right hand rule is really straightforward all you do is you take your right hand and you stick your thumb up and make a loose fist and you point it in the direction from plus to minus and if you do it right your fingers will curl round in the direction of the current so in this case the, your fingers are curling around in an anti-clockwise direction so we can draw arrows on here to show the direction that's going and so even though there's no north and south we do still have a direction for our magnetic field lines if you were to flip the um, the electricity supply with plus at the top and minus at the bottom then you just have to point your thumb downwards and now your fingers would be curling around in a clockwise fashion if we take our straight wire and coil it up we make something called a solenoid and that has a magnetic field that is similar to a bar magnet so you've sort of got a north and a south end with uh, with the uh, magnetic field lines running from north to south like that again in a similar kind of pattern couple of differences one is that the magnetic field lines run right the way through the solenoid and come back out again in sort of circles and if you look inside the center of the solenoid the field lines are more or less parallel so it's basically a uniform field inside of the solenoid and also outside the solenoid the magnetic field lines are much more widely spaced and so it's a much weaker field outside now that although it is an electromagnet the solenoid is quite a weak one on its own so to increase the strength of it we can do a couple of things first thing is we can add an iron core that amplifies the magnetic field we can add more coils of wire and we can increase the current so if you do any of those three things you'll turn a fairly weak electromagnet into a much stronger one now the motor effect this I should say is higher tier material so skip it if you're doing foundation the motor effect tells us how motors work and it's dead clever so we've just seen that if we have a wire with a current running through it it creates its own magnetic field okay this these circles are supposed to show a cross section of that wire with current running through it and the black circles are the magnetic field it's created okay now what we do is we place that inside another magnetic field a uniform magnetic field created by say a permanent magnet now if you look closely in this top section the direction of the field from the wire and the direction of the field from the um, permanent magnet are parallel to each other so they're both pointing in the same direction okay now that is equivalent to having two norths pointing uh, two, two norths repelling each other so those magnetic fields running in the same direction will repel and you'll get a force pushing downwards like this okay if we look here at this section because of the circular shape of the field from the wire now the wire is pointing or the field from the wire is pointing in the opposite direction to the field from the permanent magnet okay so that's going to create an attraction which is going to pull the wire downwards whilst at the top the wire is being pushed away so we've got a push away at the top and a pull downwards at the bottom so this creates an overall force acting in a downwards direction on that wire okay and if we did anything to flip the uh, direction of either the magnetic field so if we made that south and that north or if we changed the current running through the wire we'll get a force acting in the opposite direction so 
we can summarize that as saying the magnetic field of the wire and the magnet interact to create a force. Okay. Now, for the direction of the force, we use the left hand rule. So we stick our get our left hand and stick our thumb, forefinger, and uh, second finger out at right angles to each other. Okay. You point your forefinger in direction from north to south. Okay. And you point your second finger in direction from positive to negative uh, in terms of the current and then you stick your thumb out and that will point in the direction of the force if you're in an exam and you get a question like this do it use your left hand rule to figure out the direction of the field okay of the force rather and in terms of the overall strength of the force it's simply the magnetic flux density in teslas times by the current in amps times by the length of the wire in meters so increasing any of those things will increase the strength of the force and it's just worth saying here that this term magnetic flux density that is just the strength of a magnet and this unit here teslas is the just the unit of magnetic field strength transformers change the voltage or potential difference of an electricity supply and um, we have step up transformers that increase the voltage and step down transformers that decrease the voltage. Importantly, both step up and step down only work with alternating current. Remember, alternating current is when the electrons switch direction backwards and forwards many times each second, about 50 times per second for the mains electricity supply. Okay. Now, if we look at the structure of a transformer, we have this iron core here, uh, shaped like a square ring, and we have two coils of wire wrapped around it. The primary coil of wire is where the electricity goes in and the secondary coil of wire is where our changed uh, electricity comes back out again. Okay. Now how do they work? Well, the first thing is that you have alternating current in the primary coil creates an alternating magnetic field. So if we think about just one coil on its own, it's basically an electromagnet because you've got a coil of wire wrapped around an iron core. Now, as the electricity goes forwards and then backwards again, okay, it creates this magnetic field. And every time the electricity or the uh, electrical current changes direction, the magnetic field will change direction. So if the electric current changes direction 50 times each second, then the magnetic field will change direction many times each second. Now, the reason we have the iron core is because it amplifies the magnetic field. Okay, so we've got this magnetic field, it's switching directions many times each second. Now, as it does that, it pushes around the electrons in the secondary core. And as it as the magnetic field goes forwards, it pushes the electrons forwards, and when it flips back, the electrons go backwards. So it creates an alternating current in the secondary coil. Okay. The word we use is we say it induces an alternating current. So the magnetic field is pushing around the electrons inside the secondary coil and the word for that is it induces a current in that secondary coil okay now in terms of the sort of overall power and the transfer of energy the energy being transferred to the secondary coil must equal the energy being supplied by the primary coil and so we get this equation here that says primary voltage times primary current because that is the power in the primary coil equals secondary voltage times secondary current because again power times voltage is the current in the secondary coil the national grid is the system of uh, power lines and transformers that distributes electricity from the power stations where it is made to the homes, businesses, factories that use it. Now, importantly, it does not include the power stations. They are not the national grid. It is just the power lines and the transformers. And it works like this. Now, the, the uh, power stations themselves produce electricity with a voltage of about 25,000 volts, 25 kilovolts. That is stepped up to around 400,000 volts to be transferred through those big high voltage transmission lines you see attached to the big pylons like this. Okay, That is done because the higher the voltages 
of the uh, power line, the lower the current, and that means that less energy is lost during transmission. Now, a 400,000 volt supply going to our homes would be crazy dangerous and would lead to hundreds of deaths every year, which would obviously not be acceptable. So it's stepped down to 230 volts for use in homes, um, 11,000 volts for use in light industry, and 33,000 volts for use in heavy industry. And that's with step down transformers. Unit 12 is the particle model, which talks about density, gas pressure, energy calculations and the core practicals. Density is the mass of a substance per unit volume. Um, so often when we say that one uh, material is heavier than another, what we really mean is that the material is more dense than another one. Now we have two sets of units depending on what measurements we take. We can either talk about grams per centimeter cubed or kilograms per meter cubed. So if something had a um, density of say two grams per centimeter cubed, that would mean that a one centimeter cubed lump of it had a mass of two grams. Um, equally, if something had a density of 1,400 kilograms per meter cubed, that would mean that a meter cubed chunk of it would have a mass of 1,400 kilograms. Now, to calculate density, dead simple, we do density equals mass divided by volume, and we need to get the units right. So we're either going to have a mass in grams and a volume in centimeters cubed, or a mass in kilograms and a volume in meters cubed. Do not mix the units, it's a bit like Ghostbusters, don't cross the streams. Okay. Now, in terms of symbols, we're going to say density, which has this symbol, which looks like a P, but it's actually the Greek symbol rho, equals um, M over V. So rho equals M over V. Now, density is caused by the number of particles in a given volume. So normally, if we think about the more particles you've got in a given volume, the higher the density and the closer those particles are together, the higher the density. So for this reason, solids are more dense than liquids and liquids are more dense than gases. And we can understand that if we look at the structures of them. So um, in a solid, the particles are really tightly packed. There are no spaces, they're completely touching each other. So there are a lot of particles in a small space. In a liquid, although the particles are still touching, you can see there are these little gaps in between some of them. So they're not quite as tightly packed. And that means there are fewer particles in a given volume, which means the density is less. And in a gas, there are large spaces between all the particles. And so you get very few particles in the same amount of space. And so the density is very low. And we explored density with a core practical. Um, so the aim of it was to uh, address this question, how can you determine the density of liquids and solids? Now with liquids, it was super easy. You get a beaker and place it on a mass balance and zero it, so the balance is reading zero. Then in a measuring cylinder, measure 50 centimeters cubed of water uh, and pour it into the beaker. And then finally, you record the mass. Okay. And now if you've got the mass, you've got your 50 centimeter cubed volume, then you can just calculate the density as density equals mass divided by volume. For solids, it's a little bit more difficult because solids can't just be poured into a measuring cylinder. So what we did there was we took an object and we weighed it and we recorded the mass of the object. Okay? Then we filled, it, filled a Eureka can with water. Now this here is a Eureka can. The idea is it's got this little downwards facing spout. And once you fill it up with water to the level of the spout, the water runs out of the spout, so you cannot fill it. It's not possible to fill it above the level of the spout. Now, the clever thing is, if you then get your object and you plop it into the uh, into the Eureka can, the object displaces water, and that water runs out of the spout, out of the spout here, okay, and it collects in the measuring cylinder, okay, and the volume of water that collects is the same as the volume of the object. So now we know the volume of the object and we've already worked out the mass of the object. And so now again, we can calculate density as mass divided by volume. Temperature and state changes. So thermal energy is the total amount of energy stored in the movement of the particles in an object. 
that is slightly different to temperature. Temperature is the average movement of the particles in an object. So the higher the temperature, the faster the particles. So if we compare the hot and cold here, we can see that in the hot one, the particles are moving very quickly, and in the cold one, the particles are moving very slowly. Okay. So we say the temperature of the hot one is greater than the temperature of the cold one because the particles are moving faster in the hot one. Now, the difference between that and thermal energy is thermal energy is talking about the total amount of energy in all the particles added up together. So it's quite possible to have something cold, like a large bucket of cold water, that contains more thermal energy than something hot, like a, a red hot nail. Because although the nail has a higher temperature and each particle is moving faster than the ones in the cold water, because there are so many more particles in the cold water, then overall the total amount of thermal energy could still be greater. Now, when we talk about um, heating uh, substances, we talk about two specific quantities that are different for each type of material. We talk about the specific heat capacity and the specific latent heat. Now, the specific heat capacity is the energy needed to increase the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, to give you an idea, for water, that value is 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So if you had one kilogram of water, to increase the temperature of it by one degree Celsius takes 4,200 joules of energy. Okay, And you can see that on these graphs which show the amount of heat absorbed uh, and how that affects the temperature rise. And the gradient of these lines, that tells you the specific heat capacity. Or rather, is related to the specific heat capacity. Now, the specific latent heat is the energy needed to change the state of one kilogram of a substance from uh, solid to liquid or from liquid to gas. And we talk about two different ones. We talk about the specific latent heat of melting. That is the energy required to turn one kilogram of a substance from solid to liquid. And then the specific latent heat of evaporation is the energy required to turn one kilogram of the substance from liquid to, so to gas. And you can see that represented by these flat sections. Okay, So this flat section on the graph, all the energy is going into boiling the liquid rather than increasing its temperature. And again, here in this little flat section, you see the energy is going into melting the solid rather than uh, heating it any further. You'll notice that the value or the, the, the flat section for melting is much smaller than the flat section for boiling. And that's because it takes a lot less energy to separate the particles partly to make a liquid than it does to separate them fully to make a gas. Now, in terms of calculations, we do need to use the specific heat capacity and specific latent heat to calculate some energy changes. So with specific heat capacity, remember that is the energy required to heat one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And we talk about the thermal energy change equals the mass in kilograms times by the specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. And we give that the symbol form delta Q equals M times C times delta T. Um, the most likely place you might get caught at here is the units for mass. You may be giving grams, but it needs to be in kilograms. Okay, so it must be in kilograms, so you may need to convert. Um, note that Q, oddly, stands for um, energy change. Don't worry about why, just accept it. I would also say that this equation is in the formula sheet at the back of the paper, so you don't need to memorise it. Um, and then similarly with specific latent heat, an easy calculation this time, just the thermal energy required is the mass in kilograms times by the specific latent heat in joules per kilogram, and we get Q equals N times L. Again, look at Q being used to represent the energy. The only thing I would say with specific latent heat is it's just worth remembering that it only these calculations only work when a substance is at its melting point. So for example, the specific latent heat of boiling for water assumes that the water is already at 100 degrees Celsius. It's possible you might need to use the specific heat capacity first to figure out how much energy it takes to get to 100 and then do your specific latent heat calculation to work out how much energy is required to actually boil it. 
we did a core practical investigating what happens as you heat water um, and the aim was just to see how the temperature changes as substances are heated so the first one involved melting ice um, we got some crushed ice and we played it in a, placed it in a boiling tube so here's our boiling tube there's our crushed ice in the bottom and then we put we measured its temperature and we put that into a beaker of hot water that have been heated in the kettle like that to make a little water bath. Now we need to stop the water from cooling down, so we put it on a tripod, uh, heated it with a Bunsen burner. I hope you appreciate my amazing drawing here. So heat it with the Bunsen burner, um, and that just kept the water um, from cooling down too much. And we recorded the temperature every 30 seconds until three minutes after the ice had fully melted. And the idea then was that we drew a graph. So we had um, time on the bottom, temperature on the top. Uh, on the y-axis rather and if we did it properly we got a graph that looks something like that okay now the second one was to investigate what happens as you heat liquid water and to do this we used an immersion heater so we got a polystyrene beaker and record we used it, put it on a balance and zeroed it and then recorded the mass of water that was needed to nearly fill the beaker then we put in our immersion heater and we attached a voltmeter in parallel to the heater and an ammeter in series and the point of this was that if we could measure the voltage and the current we could calculate the power okay and if we know the power and the time we can calculate the total energy that was an alternative to using a joule meter okay which the syllabus did specify but we didn't actually have to hand um, so we heated it for five minutes recording the voltage and current and using that to work out the power and the energy transferred and then from that we could work out um, if we knew the temperature change and the energy transferred and the mass of water we could calculate the specific heat capacity of the water and if we did it right it should have come to around 4200 joules per kilogram per degree celsius Now, gas temperature and pressure. We've already met the idea that when uh, a substance is hotter, its particles are moving faster. And again, you can see that here. You can see on the hot side, the particles are whizzing around, and on the cold side, they're just kind of ambling along. Okay. Now, if we think about this, uh, this hot one on the right, uh, every time one of these particles hits the surface, okay, it pushes on that surface, and it creates a small amount of pressure. And so the pressure of a gas is sort of the sum of all of the times particles hit a surface every second. Now, if those particles are moving faster, okay, they're going to hit the surface more often. So they're going to create a higher pressure. And we sort of know this, don't we? We know ideas that, you know, uh, you know, a balloon or something like that would inflate a bit more if you heated it up because the gas expands. Um, you know that in an engine, when the hot gas is made in the engine, it expands the piston. All of that is the same idea that when a gas is hotter, the particles move faster and that creates a higher pressure, which causes the gas to expand. Okay. Now, we can actually draw uh, a graph of this and we can plot the temperature okay, of the graph and the pressure. So the temperature of the gas and the pressure of the gas. And we get a nice graph that looks something like this and if we follow this graph all the way back to here we get to the coldest possible temperature at which there is no movement at all of the particles and we call that coldest possible temperature absolute zero so at absolute zero the coldest possible temperature the particles have totally stopped moving and so there is no pressure if you think about it because if the particles aren't moving they can't hit the surface and if they're not hitting the surface, they can't be creating any pressure. Okay. Now that temperature is minus 273 degrees Celsius. Alternatively, we can call it zero Kelvin. That is not OK. That is zero K. So zero Kelvin. Okay. So Kelvin is a temperature scale that we use more commonly in science than degrees Celsius because it's uh, it's a it's an absolute measure of temperature. Now, if we want to convert Celsius into Kelvin, we have to add 273 degrees. If we want to convert Kelvin into Celsius, we subtract 273. Okay. Now, the most important thing and why, why we need to think about Kelvin is because pressure is directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. Okay. Which means, as we said, there's no pressure at uh, zero Kelvin. And every time you double the temperature in Kelvin, you double the pressure. Direct proportion 
means that the graph has a straight line and it goes through the origin through 0, 0. Unit 13, forces and matter. This really just looks at springs and spring calculations. Bending and stretching. In order to deform an object, that means bending it, stretching it or compressing it. You need two forces acting in opposite directions. So for example, to compress the spring here, you need one force going right and the other force going left. So both acting inwards and that will squash the spring up. If your two forces are acting uh, outwards, then you'll extend the spring. Okay. And if there are, you know, there are various other combinations that can make it bend and do all sorts of things. But you need at least two forces to cause something to bend, stretch or compress. Okay. Now, when we're talking about any kind of deformation, so stretching, bending or compressing, we can talk about a material being elastic or inelastic. Elastic means that when you deform an object and let go, it returns to its original shape. So think about, you know, gently bending a ruler and letting go, it goes back to being straight. Think about pressing a spring down, as soon as you let go, it goes back to its original shape. However, other changes can be inelastic. So an inelastic deformation is when uh, you change an object shape and once you let go of the forces, it doesn't go back to its original shape. So think about something like a ball of uh, blue tack and you squish the ball of blue tack. It doesn't spring back because that is an inelastic stretch. Now, really importantly for most materials, a gentle enough force will cause an elastic stretch, whereas a big enough force will cause an inelastic one. So if we think about our classic example of a spring here, put a small amount of force on that spring and it will stretch elastically. Put too much on it and it will stretch inelastically and it won't go back to its original shape. And in fact, you've kind of broken it as a spring. Now, when we talk about springs, we talk about their extension. The extension of a spring is how far it stretches when a force is applied. Okay, And you measure it like this. So you have a spring okay, attached to a, you know, some kind of support and you have some masses and you set the bottom of the spring level with zero on your ruler okay and then you add some masses and you just measure how far down the spring gets pulled uh, in this case the extension might be say 10 uh, centimeters or something like that okay now here's the thing we can then graph these uh, extensions and the force required if you put the extension on the x-axis of a graph and the force required to get that extension on the y-axis you get a graph like this which has two parts we have the uh, section here with a straight line which shows a linear relationship in direct proportion so in direct proportion remember we have a straight line that passes through zero zero passes through the origin just there okay uh, and in that straight line section doubling the uh, extension requires doubling of the force, tripling extension needs triple the force and so on. But also we have at the end a non-linear stretch uh, a section. In this non-linear section that relationship breaks down and we get a curved section on the graph. Okay. And we find that some springs, uh, for example rubber bands, they never have that linear section. So if you look at the graph for a, for a rubber band here, it know has this curved shape the entire way through and that's just a different characteristic of the type of springiness that rubber bands have and we did a core practical to investigate springs very simply the question we were asking was how does the force applied to a spring affect its extension remember extension is the distance that a spring stretches in meters okay so very simple we hung a spring from a clamp stand you can see that happening here here's our clamp stand uh, here's our spring um, and we clamped a meter rule so that the zero on the ruler was in line with the bottom of the spring that hasn't really been done very well in the diagram but we clamped it so the meter rule the bottom of the spring was in line with zero on the meter ruler then we hung a hundred gram mass from the spring and we measured the extension okay then we repeated with another hundred grams another hundred grams all the way up to a thousand grams so we end up with um, uh, 10 measurements 100 200 300 grams and so on and then what you can do is repeat the entire experiment with a different spring um, we chose a rubber band but you could choose a stiffer spring uh, a less stiff spring and so on and you can use this to compare the ways that different springs stretch 
and we have to do some calculations with springs. So uh, before we calculate with springs, we need to understand something called the spring constant. The spring constant is really a measure of the strength of a spring, and it has units of newtons per meter. Okay. Um, the strength of a spring, this spring constant, is actually the gradient of that graph. So if we find the gradient of the straight line section there, we will find the spring constant of the spring. And the higher the spring constant, the stronger the spring. This leads us on to something called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law is a, an equation that lets us understand um, the relationship between the force um, uh, put into a spring and its extension. And it's really simple. It just says force equals the spring constant times the extension, also written as F equals KX. Okay. So um, if you've got a bigger spring constant, you're going to need a bigger force to stretch it. And if you want a bigger extension, you're also going to need a bigger force to stretch it. And then lastly, we can look at the energy transfer by stretching a spring. This one is in the uh, formula sheet at the back of the exam, so you don't need to memorise it, but it always helps. And that is just the energy required to stretch a spring equals half times by the spring constant times by the extension uh, squared. And the extension is in metres. Again, just with both those extensions, when they're in metres, you might be given one in centimetres to so make sure you convert your units back to metres before you do your calculation. And finally, just a little run through all of the formulas that we're going to need. So we've got kinetic energy equals half mass times velocity squared. We've got gravitational potential energy change equals mass times gravitational field strength times height change. Work done equals force times distance. Power equals work done divided by time. Charge equals current times time. Energy equals charge times the potential difference. Potential difference equals current times resistance. Power equals current times potential difference. Power also equals current squared times resistance. Force equals magnetic flux density times current times length. Primary voltage times primary current equals secondary voltage times secondary current. Density is mass divided by volume. Thermal energy change is mass times specific E capacity times temperature change. Thermal energy is mass times specific latent heat. Force is spring constant times extension, and the energy transfer by stretching is half times the spring constant times the extension squared. And just note the stars, the ones with the star are the ones that are in the formula sheet, and so you don't need to memorize them. And a reminder just of our method for working through um, problems. So it's success D, star the target, underline the values, copy out the values, convert the units, write out the equation, converting it or rearranging it if you need to, substitute your values, solve and then don't forget your units well done for getting this far you have reached the end of this presentation as i said right at the very beginning make sure that listening isn't all you're doing you must do stuff that makes you think because when you think you learn thank you and goodbye